Welcome back to Conspiratus. For this episode, we'll be doing something a little bit different and putting out a recording of a panel that we I actually moderated back at DAPCON uh, earlier this month in August, uh, at the end of August, as part of Berlin Blockchain Week. Um, the panel was on governance, and I just really liked how the panel went, and I figured, you know, it'll be a good idea to put it out as a podcast episode, because I think more, it'll be, hopefully get more people to listen to the panel, because I think it re- went really well. So the uh, title of the panel was Tales of Governance, DAOs, Swarms, and Anarchic Systems. And on the panel, we had um, Amin Sulmani from Moloch DAO, and, you know, Spank Chain as well, but really here. He was representing Malik, uh, Stephanie Herder from the Prism Group, Jose Izquierda from Aragon, uh, Sebastian Gajek from Ditcraft, and uh, myself uh, as I was moderating. And, you know, every as I tend to do, but in some opinions every now and then, even if I'm moderating, but um, that's okay. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, you know, I'd really like to thank especially uh, the Gnosis team uh, for helping organize all of uh, DAPCON and giving me the opportunity to uh, moderate this panel in the first place. So thank you, big thank you to them. And, you know, and, and we don't really have sponsors, but, you know, shout out to Gnosis. Thank you guys. Anyways, uh, please enjoy the panel. Thanks. Uh, thank you guys all for coming. Um, yeah, and let's get this panel going uh, right before lunch. Um, and to start, yeah, so t- the topic of today's panel is governance, which uh, we just heard a talk about. And to get started, let's just, um, you know, maybe go ahead and introduce ourselves. Let's talk about, uh, let's go down the line, maybe introduce yourself, why you're interested in governance, and your most favorite governance story. Like, it could be, it, it could be in blockchains, or it doesn't have to be in blockchains. Um, mine, for example, is the 2015 New Zealand flag referendum. Uh, I'm a flag geek, and... They went through this whole process of trying to fix the New Zealand flag, and they ended up exactly where they started, and it made me very sad as a flag fan. So, uh, yeah, so you guys go ahead. Uh, Hi, I'm Amin Soleimani, CEO of SpankChain, Summoner of Malik Dao. Um, Favorite governance story, I'll just uh, pick an Ethereum one. It was uh, the combination of uh, (coughs) Aragon uh, grant proposals 41 and 42, right? Uh, where there were simultaneously two uh, votes being held uh, to decide, one, whether or not to, uh, to, to restrict Aragon from participating in uh, building on Polkadot, and the other to buy dots. Uh, and it would have been really funny if they both passed. Uh, but ultimately, the, the buy dots failed, and, and the restriction to build on Polkadot failed. And so they uh, are now building on Polkadot, but not buying dots. <laughs> All right. Hi, guys. I'm Sebastian. Um, I'm founder of uh, Ditcraft, where we use DAO approaches for software engineering. Um, and um, I wouldn't call it, yeah, I would call it also, you know, a very interesting DAO or something related to that. Um, and as a European, um, I think all Europeans have a bit suffered from the Brexit. Um, and the Brexit is, in that point, very interesting because it shows that democracy or democratic voting, which is like, you know, the core of any DAO, can work, but sometimes it's also vulnerable to ex- attacks. Um, and this is a very, very important lesson for us who build DAOs, that we really have to be um, very cautious about the protocols we implement such that DAOs really work in a very decentralized and democratic way. Hi, I'm, I'm Jorge, I'm from, from Aragon. Uh, and actually, I mean, took, took my example of uh, a fan governance, governance thing. It was super, super interesting to see how uh, out of the blue, there was a kind of this battlefield in our governance proposals. And when the deadline for, for proposals for the previous Argon network vote was, uh, there were like these two proposals. And then the voting process that was kind of decided at the, at the very end, it was really interesting to watch. And we didn't expect that it would happen so soon, like such two um, proposals with that much attention. It was very fun to see. Hello, everybody. Stephanie Herter, uh, founding economist with Prism Group. Those of you who remember five minutes ago, I was up here. Um, So there are lots of cool examples. I also really like the uh, Brexit one, especially the uh, the leave bus that was just driving around, you know, 
issuing propaganda about what would happen if, if leave was voted for, which turned out to be a big lie. Um, another example I really like is in the last Men's World Cup, um, Japan advanced out of the group round for the first time ever um, because of the, I think it was the seventh tiebreaker, which was the number of yellow cards. This was the first time this tiebreaker had ever been used. And the really, thing I really like about this example is it's kind of an arbitrary decision-making rule. And if it had been introduced during the tournament, no one ever would have used it. But because it was aligned on and agreed upon in advance, even, no matter how silly it was, it worked. Right, and the World Cup didn't explode. So design your governance in advance. Cool. And uh, my name is Sunny Agarwal. I work on uh, mostly on Cosmos, but a bunch of other things. Um, Anyway, I, I feel like I didn't give enough background on the New Zealand flag thing. Everyone hates the current New Zealand flag, but, and they had like five competitors, and there was like a rank choice voting in a round one, and then one of them won, and then that, that one was put up against the current flag in a round two, but enough people who were upset that theirs didn't win in round one voted against it in round two, and so we ended up back where we started. So that's the context of why I hate that flag referendum. So, okay, so uh, going on. So it seems that we, you know, we've been having a lot of discussion uh, about governance throughout the uh, space, and you know, I was at the uh, Governance Games event that was hosted by uh, Zero Knowledge yesterday, and I feel one of the topics that was very um, prominent was this idea of on-chain versus off-chain governance. Um, but I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to rephrase that a little bit to more, um, rules-based versus discretion-based governance, or hard governance versus soft governance, or I don't know. What do you guys think is the best way to maybe, um, what's the best terminology that we should be using, and how do you compare these, and when do you think we should use each? Feel free, anyone can, uh, yeah. Jorge, why don't you go ahead and start? No, I, I think the, there's uh, something that we've been seeing when running our own governance process is how important the off-chain or like the process that doesn't involve just voting, just like all the discussions that have been happened before, how important that is. And I think of the on-chain part just as the mechanical process by which like people are just like casting their vote and like giving their inputs to the to the machine, and then the machine just like aggregates everyone's everyone's voice. But I I think more and more the the other process that comes before to even go into both is is way more important. But yeah, I think on chain and off chain is a it's a good terminology. Yeah, people use on chain governance to describe uh, the governance of a protocol itself. Um, and if that protocol has treasury management, then where the funds should be spent. If the you know, protocol has upgrades, like something like Tezos, uh, how the upgrade should go. Um, but that isn't the entire category of on-chain governance, even though it's most commonly used to describe that thing, right? Like Moloch DAO uh, has on-chain governance because the votes actually determine how the treasury is spent, uh, but it does not have any influence over the protocol decisions, right? Uh, and I think that in that sense, on-chain governance has like a bad rap uh, because most of us, in the Ethereum community at least, uh, want our uh, protocol decision making to be separate from uh, you know, something else. Uh, we don't have a treasury either, so that there's really just no on-chain governance for anything related to the protocol. Um, but then f for off-chain, something like Aragon, uh, they have their treasury in a multi-sig, and then they have voting that happens uh, from the token holders, and so they still have control. It's, it's their discretion whether or not they follow the votes of the token holders. And I think that's a, a much safer way to start out, uh, because if you don't do that, then your in your token holders do something unexpected, or somebody who might not be incentive aligned with you buys up a lot of your tokens to get your protocol to do what they want uh, instead of what you want, then your whole protocol is now at risk. Yeah. Stephanie, you were smiling there. Why, what was up with that? No, I think that's a, I mean, that's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, allowing discretion in whether decisions are implemented can be good or bad, depending on, on what you're looking at. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned at the, the end of my talk, I agree with this view that um, on-chain versus off-chain is not really the key question. It's, you know, you need all these different parts of governance to work. You need information. You need, another example I really liked was the, um, submitting suggestions for proposals you were talking about. That's another piece that sometimes um, if you only have, you know, if your only proposals can be 
if proposals can only be you know, fully coded, sometimes you don't get that kind of information. So it's far more important to have all those different pieces than to you know, worry about on-chain versus off-chain. Yeah. So I think Eamon made a very, very good point. So um, the question is, what kind of, say, decisions um, shall, shall be democratically decided? Um, and some are very crucial. For example, if you really want to implement uh, a stable product, um, that's why I think um, asking the community for some kind of recommendation is the right way, but still say the team should decide uh, whether this is a really you know, important feature or not. Um, versus uh, there are things, situation for example, when it really comes to fund the project, um, here I believe that uh, it should be on-chain simply because it's really the community that in general you know, would contribute with the donations to the project and you know, they're like investors, they should um, also have the right to decide what happens uh, to their investment. So I mean I guess what I'm trying to ask here is there's a level of, I think, in so oftentimes there's this question about like what is the best governance thing, and I, I just don't think that's a valid question. Like different things need different types of governance. The title of this panel, I, I put it as DAOs, swarms, and anarchic systems, and I think these are like you know systems that are in decreasing order of formalization of their governance processes. And so, I mean, for example, you know. Moloch DAO has pretty strict formal rules of how you interact with it and what the rules for uh, how it changes and proposals are done and whatnot. And you should, obviously, you know, you, you created that, so you believe in that. But at the same time, you for Ethereum, you believe in the more anarchic uh, governance of Ethereum. And so what is it about Ethereum governance as a chain that you believe in anarchic systems, but in this Moloch DAO idea, you believe in more formalized systems? Yeah, so the reason that you know, I'm building on Ethereum is because it is really hard to shut down an application that you deploy to Ethereum. Uh, you would need 51% you know, of the miners to censor you for a really long time. Uh, and if it was, for example, like a coin vote on uh, who to censor uh, or, or somehow fork the protocol in order to set somebody's balance to zero, then it would be a lot easier to do stuff like that. And that would give me less confidence to build on Ethereum. And I, I think that that would give less confidence to basically everybody to build on it. Um, but when it comes to just, you know, Malik DAO is not about protocol updates. It's just about how do we spend money on grants. And in that case, your voting is like proportional to how much money you have and you can leave whenever you want. Um, and, and that's just like a better system for people who want to put money towards this thing because it's safe. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So um, I'm a, f uh, a favor a bit, but again, from case to uh, case, it might be different. But in general, I'm a favor in giving a bit more structure because the real power of a DAO is that you really have some experts, so, uh, some community, people that care what you do, right? They are passionate about that. Um, and um, asking them what is good or bad for a project, for the decision, is for any, uh, say, project which really wants you know, to grow, actually a, a key feedback. Um, but in order to leverage this, say, community power, this community knowledge, you really have to help them. You, know, you, you cannot ask them for a, say, very universal question, but you really have to guide them. You really have to precise you know, what kind of uh, answer you'd like to ha have from that, just in order to make sure that, say, the majority of us uh, community uh, um, voters really do understand uh, what kind of information you need from that. Yeah? So there is a good analogy maybe to say classical um, say, um, project development. For example, if you design and develop a feature, you know, once the feature is done, the first thing you should do is you, know, you ask you know, some kind of early adopters, do you like it or not? And this information is really like gold. Because without that feedback, right, you might develop feature by feature by feature, end up in a product that really no one wants. Um, and that's why community is key. And helping the community uh, and or guide the community to give you some kind of feedback which is relevant for the progress of your uh, project is also important. So would it be fair, oh, Stephanie, do you have something to add? So, um, yeah, I was just going to say, I think that um, 
You know, in my view, a lot of the early projects that didn't really have formal governance have just gotten incredibly lucky. And they, you know, through a combination of charismatic leadership and people in the, being in the right place at the right time, they've avoided you know, completely exploding. But I think in the future, most projects will need, I mean, the degree to which you're gonna have you know, different kinds of specified governance, you have one process or a thousand, I think is gonna vary, but I think you know, most projects will end up having some kind of foundational governance which at least allows you to update the governance itself, right, to evolve over time. So you'd be more in favor of going forward new projects or new chains even, uh, using more formalized processes, more in the realm of like Tezos style governance with formalized processes. I think so, and uh, one of the analogies I like to use is, is the representative versus the vigilante, um, which is that, you know, in a crisis situation, you know, there's, when there's a vacuum and there's not a specified person who's gonna take control, um, your system is vulnerable, right? You can just have you know, random charismatic leaders show up and take over. So you know, at least specifying what's gonna happen in a crisis situation and who has power then is very useful. So one way I like to think about it is that we have like layers and you have a bunch of formal layers and almost always inevitably at some point you have an informal layer. And you know, it, I think when we're talking about whether the chain should have uh, formalized governance or not, we're basically asking about where to put that uh, breakpoint. Where on Ethereum, for example, the breakpoint is, uh, you know, the, the chain is anarchic and the stuff on top is formalized. While in Tezos, the chain is formalized, but then the process, the meta chain, which is the ability to fork Tezos, and we see that happening today where there are, there is a, a project that's in the process of forking Tezos. And so then we, we just basically, t we still have, all of these things end up becoming anarchic systems, but we just moved it one layer down. And so when you're designing um, even more stuff on top, is it possible, well, how about this? Is it possible to build an anarchic system on top of a formalized system? Yeah, I think that by definition is quite hard. I think it's way easier to build a, a, a formalized system on top of an, uh, of an anarchic system. Um, but yeah, I think that in the, in the case of chain governance, in the case of, of Ethereum, um, it's, it, it's very interesting that there, the decisions that are being made with EIPs are very, very different from like reprising some upcodes due to clearly technical reasons to like making economic decisions. Uh, that are very, very important. And for, for those, I, I believe it would be interesting to get ETH holders uh, involved in those because it's like making economic decisions are the, the stakeholders that, that should definitely decide and not the people that are just um, writing, writing the code for that. Would it be, what are some of the cons of uh, anarchic systems when it comes to protocol governance. So, you know, for whether examples from Ethereum or from Bitcoin, like, you know, I, I think that like some of the Segwit2x stuff shows that like when you don't have more formalized systems, you get a case where you have loud voices. And so how do you solve that in that, those cases? I, I don't wanna say solve, but uh, definitely anarchic systems are less efficient. Uh, it's in, in, a, in a highly contentious issue, it's pure chaos. Uh, and it ends up being a free-for-all where basically if it's like a you know, binary split, then two groups form and both try to tell everybody that they're bigger than the other group uh, to try and accomplish the self-fulfilling prophecy of attracting more support so that they eventually win a hard fork showdown. And that means that you are trying to recruit every single person in the protocol to join your side and signal on that side. And that's not an efficient process. If you had a formalized system that had, for example, representatives, you would say, okay, well, I'm just gonna you know, point to that person, somehow signal that I'm supporting them and then allow that person to make a, or influence the decision-making process on my behalf, which saves me a lot of time as a, uh, somebody who's delegated that responsibility. Anyone else have anything to add? Okay. Um, so, sorry, one second. Um, so, one, one thing I like to think about is sometimes maybe what you need is formalized governance over property and assets and things that don't, aren't limited property and assets are 
you don't need governance over. So I, I mean, I think the easiest way to explain why Moloch needs formalized governance is you have a scarce assets that you're governing. What do you do in the cases where um, we have the op option to make an asset either scarce or not? And I think the uh, best example and the, probably the most relevant to blockchains is uh, trademarks. So, you know, we have some, some, some trademarks in the space, like Bitcoin, are completely like, you know, just un, out in the open. Anyone has the option to call their own thing Bitcoin and it really is up to the soft consensus to decide what is true or not. While some projects like, you know, Zcash and Ethereum a lot gave it to a foundation to uh, say, to enforce the trademark. Um, and maybe there's other ways of enforcing the trademarks. And so what do you guys think about, one, how important are trademarks and, and like names and how should we govern, govern names? Um, let me start here. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, so, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go, go? go ahead. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I think it's a general question about the value of trademarks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a reason why, you know, people apply for, uh, for trademarks because they think that, say, the name or the product has certain value and they would like to protect it. Then there are other, a lot of other applications where a trademark has no value. Um, because it's, uh, the value is maybe in the product or in the team or uh, uh, in the property they own. Um, and n another question is, so, um, you know, whether, say, Bitcoin or Zcash, you know, is, is a trademark, and I think um, the team or the people behind that should decide whether, you know, they appreciate the value of this uh, trademark or maybe the product, uh, you know, the software stack they develop. Um, yeah, that should be part of a community decision. So do you think that, so for Ethereum, what do you, do you think that long-term uh, the trademark of the name Ethereum should remain in the hands of the Ethereum Foundation? And if not, what is a alternative for who should govern that trademark? Or should we just put it out in the open like Bitcoin does? I think something that would be pretty cool, even though if it's like uh, uh, a bit sci-fi, is that if you have a, a DAO controlled by, by ETH holders that controls a legal entity that can legally hold the trademark and allow ETH holders to, to control this. Uh, but if system. Ethereum blockchain itself split, now there's two, which ETH holder set chooses that trademark Ethereum? Yeah, that would be, that would be interesting. I mean, you, you, could also, you could also have like a, a coin boat be, like with, the, with the balances in the, in the past to make that, those sort of decisions, but that would be an interesting challenge, yeah. So basically we'll say that like, okay, there'll, there'll be a trailing track of balances, let's say, you know, we'll decide the balances from one year ago are what decide the trade, get to vote on what the trademark is. That could be an option, yeah. That'd be interesting. It seems reasonable. I mean, I don't have a better plan. Uh, just keep the foundation until the foundation goes away. This is why we need lawyers. <laughs> are any of us on stage lawyers? No. no. Okay. Well, that's, that's problematic. Um, so... Okay, um, so, so do you think that in the space there's an overuse of formalized systems? Um, you know, one thing, one question I have about the DAO, which like the, the original one was, I, I, I never really quite understood it. I never saw the point of it. Why are people having to pool money for, you know, I, I think it could be done as a much more liveness or I see DAOs as safety favoring organizations while swarms are more liveness favoring organizations. And you know, I think the ICO uh, system of 2017 proved that we didn't, maybe we didn't need that collective action that the DAO was bringing. And so uh, Jorge, like, you know, as someone who's building a project that's going out and telling people to build more DAOs, like w do you think we're building too many DAOs or um, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're building to too many DAOs. I think the ability to come together and pool money with uh, pseudonymous people to to do some sort of things. I think it can it can be super super uh, powerful. And something really cool ar around the DAO is the amount of due diligence that was being made in the proposals, even if they were asking for not a lot of not a lot of funding. And I think as we saw in in 2017, like there was no like no due diligence at the at the scale that the DAO was doing. Um, so I think that even if it's just by asking money to this particular DAO, it triggers like a big community to analyze a, a proposal and, and make a decision. I think that that would have been really, really positive. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to see more, more DAOs flourish. Uh, I'm also very, very uh, happy to see um, so many DAOs because the DAO is, in fact, a very, very powerful paradigm. But as with any new paradigm, we first of all have to learn. Um, we have to understand what is the real power and the real value of this uh, new paradigm. Um, and the only way we learn is just, you know, by doing experiments, by trying out new DAOs, seeing what works, and uh, derive from that why it works. Yeah, I think. Just building on that, I mean, almost any legal system or decision-making system, you know, gets more formal over time, right? You start with a basic, I mean, I'm going to use the U.S. government again, but you start with constitution and a basic set of rules, and over time, you know, a legal system develops and um, precedent develops, and, you know, people don't want to rethink decisions every single time they're being made, right? So there's this question of, okay, we've seen this before, this is what we did before, do we have a compelling reason to change what we did? Otherwise, you know, we have a defined process for, for how certain decisions are going to be made. So I think that formalization is good, and we're going to see more formalization either through explicit rules or just people having a shared understanding of how things are going to work. It's also possible that we might be learning the wrong lesson from the ICO boom of 2017 if we think that uh, the DAO wasn't needed. Uh, because like Jorge was saying, the, the DAO helped a lot of uh, do concentrated due diligence on all the projects that went through it. So there's another reality where the DAO didn't explode magnificently, and there was a huge amount of due diligence on all the projects that tried to ICO, and a lot uh, of the scams were filtered out. Another question uh, with DAOs is that, you know, for example, Vlad uh, will often say that one of the issues with formalized governance is that it inevitably leaves out certain groups of stakeholders and that it only represents certain factions within a uh, community. How, when you're building a DAO, how do you make sure you're representing uh, many different, all, all the different stakeholders in your community and not just net your, your token holders? Yeah, I think that uh, for this, um, it's interesting to build systems that are not just like simple majority voting of, of coin of certain coin holders, but try to build like uh, give um, like identify other other stakeholders in in some way. And this is the, the part where it gets challenging: who gets to decide, who's gonna who's gonna decide. But I can totally see that we form like this. Um, bicameral systems in which like you have like the coin voter like the coin holders voting in some way and then uh, reputation slash identity slash core devs uh, system that gets uh, gets built on the other side and here you can start having like um, see how they're competing competing incentives um, basically bound the bound their powers um, and I can totally see like a, a governance system that gets inputs from from many different um, sets of stakeholders, but again, the challenge is who gets to to pick these people in the in the first place. And I think there's a lot of work to be done here. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, any formal governance system is going to be imperfect and is going to need to evolve over time, um, and that's okay. And so, just saying, well, formal governance is always imperfect, therefore we're not going to have any, is, in my opinion, not the right way to go. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I also think that we still have to learn a lot and I think one of the key challenges uh, will be to understand, say, what is the right voting scheme. Uh, because a voting scheme is nothing else than a consensus protocol, but for the people, not for the machines. Um, and, you know, um, 
look how many years actually the community needed in order to learn and understand you know, how a proper consensus protocol you know, for layer one works. Uh, now we're facing exactly a similar challenge. We really have to learn, to research, to explore how, uh, say, a DAO-based consensus protocol, namely voting scheme, works. Um, and once I think we solve this problem, you know, we will also you know, have the insights you know, how to st structure and build uh, um, a DAO that uh, is, say, stable enough, which is not uh, susceptible to attacks, and which really delivers uh, what we expect from the DAO, namely, say, the uh, knowledge and the power of a community just in order to progress. So when you're building an organization, um, you, you know, in the blockchain space, we talk a lot about the ability to exit and why that's important. But sometimes you want there to be a bit of cohesive force to the, uh, to the organization that even if people uh, disagree, you don't want it to just, br the, the community to fracture every time there's a small disagreement. And so how do you, when you're uh, designing a DAO, do you, or any organization, do you decide how much cohesion and how much exit force to put? So for example, in Moloch, the, it's very easy to exit and rage quit from, from, the, from the DAO. While, for example, uh, I'm not too familiar with Aragon, but I know in uh, DX DAO, it's, you, you actually can't exit. Like, there is no ability for you to leave the DAO. You can just stop participating altogether, but you can't actually, like, get rid of your tokens even, or shares in the DAO. So how do you choose how much exit versus cohesive force to put into it? Yeah, something that we're that we're working on now it's it's this concept of proposal agreements that we're calling it, um, and the idea is uh, we are trying to solve uh, to protect from 51% attacks in the in the DAO in an in a way that is not as um, destructive or disruptive as as exiting, even though exiting can make sense for for some types of organizations. So the way that this works is that before making a proposal, the proposer basically has to stay, put some collateral behind their, their proposal to guarantee that they adhere to the rules that the organization has for making proposals. Like, okay, did we accept like these types of proposals, they need to um, benefit all token holders equally or whatever the, the rules are. And then there can be a challenger that says, okay, this is, this is definitely not the um, not bound to the rules of the of the organization, and then a dispute is it's, it's created, and there's a dispute resolution pro process that that happens that eventually rules whether the proposal was valid or not according to the rules of the organization. So we're very excited to roll this out and have this other alternative to try to um, not break the break an organization in, in case an attack is an attack is made um, because some of these attacks are actually pretty cheap. Uh, pretty cheap to make, like an, a, a, in a doubt that is totally public and anyone can propose, it's like totally free to make a credible commitment that everyone that votes yes in this proposal to steal all the money from the DAO is gonna get a share of the money, like all the money that we steal. And this costs like literally zero, zero to make. So you can put boundaries like saying, okay, only members can can vote uh, can create new proposals but this is the other approach that we're taking to try to keep the organizations um, cohesive so a couple pieces i think you know for platforms i think most blockchain platforms have significant network effects so in general we don't want people you know stomping off and quitting if we don't need them to um, and a couple pieces that we found are, are particularly helpful um, in minimizing sort of the number of rage quits, which is a super awesome term. I'm gonna use it now constantly, because it's great. Um, are thinking about, you know, first the proposal process. Um, you know, before even the proposal process, one of the reasons I love that World Cup example is because, you know, having valid governance that people agree is legitimate, no matter how weird it is, is, is very useful. So just saying these were the rules we decided on in advance uh, can reduce the probability you're gonna get people stomping off on you. Um, and I also think, you know, after that, you know, if you're looking at more incremental proposals, you're less likely to have a group of people rage quit. Um, so thinking about the proposal process and also how information is shared can help, you know, keep your community together, all other things constant. Yeah, the, the exit privilege is important for just protecting the members, right? Uh, if the, the pitching Moloch was way, really easy because people asked, how do I get out? And I'm like, whenever you want, right? And 
in an Aragon DAO, uh, at the time, you would have needed to like submit a proposal to get your money out that would have needed to have been approved by the other members. And if somebody controls most of the voting power, then you're sort of screwed if they don't want your, to get your money out. Um, and it depends on how much the people in, in the DAO trust each other. It depends how susceptible it is to capture. If it's an open system, this is a, a larger concern. Moloch is permission membership anyway, so it's somewhat less of a concern. But I wanted to just err all the way on the side of safety because we were living in the shadow of the DAO and like most people had PTS DAO and like I didn't want to be that guy, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, maybe now that we have this precedent, like people will be a little bit more comfortable taking on somewhat more risk, and you know what you're getting into up front, like, hey, okay, maybe, you know, I can get in, but like, if I leave, I'm leaving like 5% of my money in this thing. And, uh, you know, I can calculate like the chance that I think that it's gonna get hostily taken over and I'm gonna lose that um, against, you know, how much I, I care about that money. Um. When do you, how do you make sure that uh, these voting systems don't, you know, I, th I think there is a value to conservatism sometimes and tradition, and that sometimes over-liberalism is also kind of can be dangerous and, you know, populism, for example. And like, how do we make sure these DAOs that are, we, we, you know, essentially DAOs, we've made it decrease the cost of voting and we've decreased the cost of executing the results of voting. How do we make sure that we don't just fall into these you know, bad game theoretic traps or populistic, like, situations. Yeah, this is another another thing that we're trying to solve with these uh, proposal agreements in which the, the organization, when it's created at the beginning, you can set um, a set of rules or a manifesto for, for the organization and say, okay, until we decide to change it, and this is the way that we would go around to change it, all the proposals and everything that the DAO does need to, need to adhere to this. Um, and you can get into a situation that even if you have a super majority or 90% of the DAO that says, um, okay, we want to pass this proposal, if it doesn't go according to the rules uh, that were uh, set at the beginning, it shouldn't, shouldn't pass, even if the organization, um, like a, a large amount of token holder wants to do it. Um, and then you can have like your process for changing the manifesto that can be like longer or require like almost un um, like a unanimous vote. Um, so I think that's, that's a way like, when people get in, you know what you're buying into and changing that um, subjective um, contract of what your organization does is like a very, very hard process that, that requires a lot of time. So there's time for people to exit or uh, change course. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great example and I would uh, even uh, generalize a bit more. So the challenge here is uh, we really need to research, say, what uh, voting protocols really work. And I see populism, uh, you know, like an attack against, you know, a voting protocol. You know, for example, like uh, when you break crypto, you know, you can break a security protocol. If you have a voting uh, protocol, you need to design it in such a way that it's resistant against, you know, maybe uh, populism as an attack. Um, and here, I think uh, uh, we need to ask the research community to really, you know, think out of the box and maybe come up with new ideas which go far beyond, uh, you know, the, uh, maybe the uh, one voter, one vote approach or one stake, uh, one vote approach. Uh, maybe we really need totally new, different uh, voting protocols here. So. Kind of to zoom out a little bit, um, what happens when, so, so you know, I think one way um, I, I think of governance is that it's coordinating to solve game theory problems. Um, and, but to solve a game theory, to set up a game theory game in the first place, you need to assume everyone has somewhat aligned utility or, or somewhat, or common utility or somewhat aligned values. And, how do we govern, how, what do we do in situations where communities just have differing values? And like an example, like not even in blockchain, like in the real world, like, you know, I used to, th you know, I used to be like pro open borders, but then it occurred to me, like what if two societies have fundamentally different beliefs in property rights? Like you have one that believes in private property and you have another that believes in like Glenn Wool's like radical markets stuff. Um, how do you like even how do you how can you possibly govern 
people who have so fundamentally differing values. Of course. No, I was just going to say, typically they fight it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there are certain situations where you don't necessarily want to have everybody in the same community, right? So um, when you were asking about um, status quo bias, I kept thinking about um, another U.S. example, but in the U.S., the Senate has something called the filibuster, where you need 60 votes in order to, out of 100 to pass anything, and this is why we don't have gun control, because they have enough, you can't get 60 votes to override the lack of gun control. And so I think that, you know, there are certain circumstances where you're just going to have communities that don't necessarily want to be together. On the other hand, I, I will have to disagree with your initial statement. I think that, you know, if, if everyone had the same preferences, we don't even need governance. Like, the reason we need collective decision making is that people do disagree. So there's sort of a spectrum where if everyone had the same preferences, then we just have you make all the decisions, right? Because you have the same preferences as everybody else. Um, whereas if we, you know, some of us don't believe in private property and others do, then you have Glen World and another world. And in the middle, you sort of figure out what you're going to do. Um, okay. What, what, what do you do when, um, for example, you're just in a prisoner's dilemma of, of a massive scale and we just need coordination? And, you know, for example, I think climate change is an example where, you know, it seems like it's in everyone's incentive to try to solve it. Uh, but for any single nation state, it seems in their economic incentive to just fuel development as fast as possible. And so how do we if not governance, but how do we encourage coordination? Well, governments are interesting because they govern down, but nothing governs them, uh, right? Like governments exist within a state of anarchy relative to each other. Uh, so you would need some other form of government or governance structure to then impose its will on each country and uh, benefit the countries that do the climate change thing and don't you know, attack or somewhat harm or inflict some cost on the countries that don't. Uh, and so I, how do you get that? I don't know. Uh, is it a blockchain thing? Maybe if it's like, a, you know, throw eggs at the senators that haven't like voted for climate change and like we make a DAO for that and then get all the senators decide that they don't want to be the only ones to not vote on climate change. Uh, that would be really cool. If anybody's trying to do that, let me know. Um, so <laughs> Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Would anyone like to pose any questions? Okay. Um, Gun control via eggs. All right. All right there. It should be um, mics need to be taken down. We might need to borrow one for to pass mine. Here we go. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Up Thank to you. you. Couple of questions, guys, because lunch is beckoning. Cool. Not that I want to stop a discussion of supranational right. DAO driven government. Okay. That's or. a good topic. Oh. Okay, hello. I just want to ask about some complicated governance mechanisms being formed. Uh, for example, in Polkadot, which starts to resemble, as Gavin Wood said, uh, British Parliament with uh, Council of Wizards and uh, Chamber of High Priests or whatever that was. And at the end, there is also some kind of grand jury of uh, oracles, which is uh, um, governed by reputable professionals from the real world. So uh, in this particular example, it kind of feels that we are moving away from the anarchic systems, which are kind of uh, governed uh, bottom up to the same old thing we already know from the real world, which is like top down elitist uh, kind of parliament like structure. So what is your take on that? Did you guys get that? Uh, it's, a li it's a little hard to hear. I, I, was, ah, I, think, I think he was asking, uh, aren't, aren't we replicating the same governance systems? Uh, yes, uh, like I Polkadot? kind of feel that, uh, especially in Polkadot, but maybe in other systems as well, uh, we are uh, getting to a point where we kind of create the same structures we already know from the real world. We just put tokens in there and some kind of blockchain infrastructure, but at the, at the end, it is not any different. So if you have any take on that can't speak for Polkadot. Uh, it seems kind of complicated. I uh, hope it works. Yeah. Same here. I think Polkadot is like, you know, uh, has its own ecosystem. Um, I'm, I'm not very familiar with all the details. I'd like to take a, uh, you know, uh, a view that like maybe 
I guess I'm the moderator, but I'd like to take a view that, you know, we sh that might not be a bad thing. Like, you know, I think we should maybe appro approach it that we should respect that the current systems in the real world have some reasons that they develop in that way. And there might be ways that, like, even the transparency benefits of being on a blockchain and the openness benefits are beneficial, even if we have some of the similar structures that already happen. And that, I mean, that, I'm looking to this from, like, I've been doing a lot of research on the monetary side of, like, how currencies work and stuff. And I think that, like, even if we, even, like, something like a dollars on the blockchain seems to be beneficial on net. So I, 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 think, it's, I think it's good for experimentation that different projects are trying different types of governance. I agree with that. I think that there are a lot of systems that are in their place for a reason. I think the more I work in blockchain governments, the more amazed I am that most of our national governance, governments work the way that they do. They're remarkable. Um, and, you know, having people use similar system with tweaks will allow us to see what works and what doesn't. Um, another thing we're actually looking into that nobody's mentioned is, you know, the internet has governance. And unless you're super involved in it, you don't think about it because it just works. And a lot of the problems that blockchain governance is having was solved by, you know, ICANN and the other governance bodies of the internet. So I think that there's a lot to be learned from them too. Super. One, do you want to do one more? Sure. One more? Yeah, thanks. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to ask a question to you guys. Uh, so governance is really like a matter of uh, linking the social layer of problem solving to a certain, you know, to a certain end with the technical side of, you know, game theoretically aligning all these incentives. So my question is, would governance uh, be more efficient within any DAO as long as they spec the goal of governance as clearly as possible? And if they spec the goal of governance as clearly as possible, they're able to sort of engineer the system to work like game theoretically as, as, as well as it can. Right, uh, so let me try to phrase my question correctly. Uh, isn't finding out preference, uh, to use uh, uh, your framework, uh, isn't finding out preference a matter of best describing the goal to any governance community? Yeah, and I think that there's a lot that you can do in the, in the mechanism and like with, with code, but there's uh, also a lot of norms and subjective stuff that you can just like, uh, write in in English or in whatever whatever language, uh, and make that the expectation of the of of the system that we're gonna behave in this way. Um, and you can do your best to uh, build code around that so that the the process uh, goes with that. But I believe that there's there's also a very important like just subjective uh, layer of that you don't want to try to write in solidity. All right, thank you guys for coming and. Uh Go have a good lunch. Thanks. Thanks very much for that panel. For this episode, we're going to be doing something a little.